This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. We are so glad you've joined us here with this beautiful scene. We've got elephants at the waterhole having the best time of their life. We've got monkeys, we've got geese, hammercoppies, even a warthog that's coming to try and join us. I hope that you're going to enjoy this afternoon's wonderful sunset safari. beautiful things having the best time of their life. As you know, these are elephants and they are having a massive mud wallow. I almost wish that I could be in that scene with them right now. All right. Thank you for joining us here at Pride Lens Conservancy. My name is Michael Anderson and behind the camera we've got Gerrit and here we've got this beautiful scene. I can't tell you how amazing it is to have this almost on a daily basis. Uh, we are sitting at the dam that's right next to our camp here at Eco Training and uh, if you hear any noise in the background, that's what it is. Uh, so don't worry if you hear any banging noises in the background. The students are actually getting ready for a, for a sleep out somewhere on the, on the reserves. That'll be fantastic for them. Really excited. Look at these elephants. So they came in a few moments ago and started to, to drink and now they've finished drinking. And it's a hot day actually. This morning was very warm and today has been very warm as well. I think it's 28 degrees today. And so the elephants are just making the most of this nice cool water. Really, really spectacular to see. There's a warthog there just to the right. I don't know if you see that. It's just trying to sneak its way into the mud that the, the elephants are disturbing. <laughs> just over there. So it's wonderful to see. So what they'll do after this, most likely, what they have been doing, these elephants are, are going to go and probably dust bathe after this. So they get the dust on their body after all this mud, helps to dry it up, and it serves multiple... Oh, look at that one lying down in the mud. No way. And look, it's flicking its foot around. When it tries to get up, you'll see it'll use its foot to try and get some momentum. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so what they will do... This helps them to stay cool from the sun. It also helps against biting insects. Oh, this is amazing. I mean, you ever seen, I don't know, on safaris, often kids, when you find a mud wallow, that's what they want to do. They want to climb in that mud. And elephants are literally just like people. I think they forget that they're not people sometimes. Look at they're doing. Th that one there looks like it's literally buried its face in the mud. And so the mud gets in all the little cracks and crevices and helps to keep the bitey insects away. Well, look at that one just swinging its leg around. Yeah, that's right. You get that mud. Get that mud. And there's that big elephant Kumo that you can see in the middle of the picture there. Um, the, the biggest male in the area at the moment. So <laughs> I think it was really... Uh, this is a lot of fun. I mean, just to watch them is a lot of fun. And, uh, you know... Uh, I can imagine that they're having fun. You know, you watch elephants quite often and you just think to yourself, there's no other reason for them to be doing it the way they're doing it unless it's fun. I mean, look at that little pile of elephant bodies. I mean, they don't need to be covering themselves in mud like this. This is purely just uh, an enjoyment factor that they're having right now. Because you see their old um, Kumo on the left. He's trying, to be, he's trying to be really, you know, majestic about the whole thing. But you can see he really wants to be in the mud too. I'm pretty sure about it. It's that big elephant that you can just see at the back there. So all the, it's interesting, all the babies are right in the middle there, all the youngsters piling up in there. But they have to be so careful because the big elephants might come and roll in there and you never know if they also just get all squished in the mud there. And they have to be careful, actually, because the mud is getting deeper and deeper every time they do this. And so sometimes you see the little ones trying to really get themselves unstuck. Oh, wow. I've never actually seen so many elephants mud wallowing in one little patch before. This is actually phenomenal. David, this is no doubt elephants having fun. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've, I've mull I, I would say I've wallowed a few times in my life, and it's always fun. There's never a time when wallowing isn't fun, I believe. 
But look at them now. So they all seem to be starting to get up and except that one who's just, I think it's just sleeping in there now. It's like, this is the most comfortable place I could possibly be. This is just where I'm going to stay. <laughs> um, and now they'll probably go up. You'll see them going to the right in a moment and they'll start to cover themselves in dust. Well, that's what they usually do. And it's interesting. I just hear some low rumblings. I don't know if you can hear that. Let's just be quiet for a moment. And they seem to have stopped now, but often the matriarchs of the herd, the female that is the most uh, experienced and usually the oldest female, will give some sort of a signal to say to everyone, all right, enough, enough, let's keep moving, let's go and do the next thing now. And you'll see them all almost as one starting to move on to the next uh, little bit of beauty therapy. So you can see some of them now rolling in the dust just to the right there, uh, beginning to, to cover themselves in the dust, which will dry off the mud. Because the wind is a little bit chilly. It's, it's a hot sun, but the wind is a bit chilly. So that'll dry off the dust, and then uh, then they'll be safe from any biting insects. The one female in the middle there, I don't know if you see the one that's surrounded by all the youngsters. She looks very, very big. It might be that she's pregnant. She's a very, very wide belly. Maybe she's maybe she's got a youngster that's that's going to appear in the, next, uh, in the next little while. Could be a long while, though. They have a gestation of about two years, which is crazy. Oh, look at the babies playing. Tammy, yes. Uh, Tammy asked, would mud help to fight off parasites? And absolutely, that's exactly what it's good for. Um, they will cover themselves in a thick layer of this mud, and then anything like ticks and fleas and biting flies, they can't penetrate that layer of mud, especially once it's dried. <laughs> oh, look at those youngsters. I can't stop, I can't stop staring at them. It's just too cute. Um, and then what they'll often do is go and rub themselves against uh, trees and then any ticks and fleas and parasites that were caught in that mud when it dried will get ripped off the skin uh, and left on the tree. And sometimes uh, when we're lucky enough, we can actually find a freshly uh, rubbed tree with those ticks still in there and moving about trying to escape. So definitely uh, it does help against parasites. I mean, we, we, we do it often, you know, as humans, we exfoliate, we rub ourselves with... with uh, rough things to try and clean our skin as well. All right, what I'm going to do now is we're going to send you over to Barney, who's at another water hole, to enjoy that beautiful scene too. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to and beyond Gala. We remember for the first 45 minutes of our drive, kids, can you can send your questions to Kids at World Earth TV. My name is Barney. I am with Owen, our cameraman of the day. We just arrived on a water hole, catching a few different animals, having their afternoon drink. Some kudos there to our left, drinking carefully. Keep going. So they standing there on the edge, not wanting to put their feet in the water at all, just making sure that there is nothing to grab them. If you look at these kudos, you know, there's a beautiful reflection of them in the water there, with the ox packers all over around them, which is also another thing that's making them a bit nervous, because as they try to drink, the ox packers fly and land on them, and they think that something big is catching them. It's always a great thing to be so alert in and around the water because this is the same thing. The predators come down to drink and they might end up ambushing them. The kudos look like they have had their drink and they're ready to move out of this hot sun. We're going to move across on the other side of the water hole and catch that desert of zebra that's nicely lined up and also catching their drink. They're not looking as jumpy as the kudos were been standing there for a while and it looks like they might have covered some nice distance to get into this water hole. It has been a seriously hot day today for a winter day. So we're gonna just watch them drink for a bit here. And it looks like they are ready to move on in a short while. And we're also gonna get out of this nice hot sun and see what we can get. Good afternoon from another glorious day at Swana Kalahari. Jandre and myself are with you. Um, 
So we came out, sorry, I'm just getting all excited. There's a clue in that image there. You see those birds, there we go, look at that ears. Those birds flying up and down. There's an aardvark. The first animal we've seen out this afternoon is an aardvark. Can you believe that? Even I'm like a little bit like taken aback. That's, I'm just gonna shuffle there. So guys, we just so you know, we are miles away from that aardvark. Well, when I say miles, we're probably like 200 meters distance. Um, he's just, we actually saw him coming around from the left, hand, from the left, moving to the right. It's just behind those bushes there. And um, we are quite far away. The wind is in our favor at the moment. So I think what we're gonna try do, we're gonna give it a minute or two, and then we're gonna see if we can actually move a little bit closer, either carrying the camera handheld, um, but I'm just, am a little bit cautious about the birds starting to give alarm calls. So let, let's just, Watch him from a distance first, and then see, and then we'll make a call and see what he does. But he's very relaxed there at the moment. He's feeding, and you see, there's the anteating chats coming in. I can't believe this. This is, I was expecting to be out for like at least like another hour, hour and a half before seeing this, and there you go. This is exciting stuff. Eh? We had something the other day that we got quickly. What was it? Oh, yeah, this is a magic start. And um, John and I are just laughing because we did the same thing the other day. We were waiting for the brownie hina, hoping, and we thought we were going, only getting it much later. And next thing, there's a brownie hina just after we settled in the heart. And here, the first animal out that we see is an art fog. I can't believe this. Yeah. Um, yeah we do, I know it's behind the bushes. We just need to be patient because they... Monique says she loves those ears. I love any ear attached to any animal, but odd fog ears are particularly cute. I don't know why, but they are. If he moves behind the bushes, then we're gonna see if we can, and there we go. So John and I think we're gonna see if we can actually somehow get a better sighting and we'll Good afternoon everyone and welcome. We have a giraffe to start our live safari off here at Juma Reserve. And talking of ears, there's something wrong with this giraffe's ossicorns, I think. The right one looks slightly pink and looks like there's been some damage at some point. So it's a hot day here and this giraffe is absolutely concealed shade, which I would love to be doing. My name is Lauren. I do have BK on camera, it's 31 degrees Celsius here, 87 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's hot for winter. That's summer in Scotland. That's a heat wave in Scotland, actually. So this is exactly what this giraffe is doing. Now, I think it's a male, judging by the baldness on the ossicorns and the dark patches, but I haven't done a genital check yet. Is that a wound, BK? On the neck, if you just go down a little bit further, there seems to be a patch of hair missing. I wonder if it's a scar. I think it is. The giraffe's injured itself somewhere along the line. And of course, it's got the usual hitchhikers in the form of the ox peckers. They probably are pulling off all those delicious ticks. I wonder what's happened to this giraffe, actually. It's got an injury and a bent ossicone. Now, they're not horns, we call them ossicones with giraffes. And they're actually very soft and rubbery, made from cartilage when the giraffe is born. And this is to prevent any injury to the mother. And only when the giraffe calf starts to grow will they harden, will they ossify, and they turn into bone. <laughs> giraffe can't make up his mind. Does he want to eat the delicious leaves lower down or? Should I stretch out my neck and eat the leaves higher up? 
I think the higher up ones are obviously a lot delicious. A lot more delicious than the lower ones. Thick rubbery lips and a very thick rubbery tongue. And it needs to be thick and needs to be rubbery to avoid getting injured from any thorns and spines. Jackie, I completely agree with you. This male is very calm. I think it's because we're at quite a distance and he's obviously just enjoying the shade. Animals get too hot, just like we do. And for mammals, seeking shade is one of the best options you have. Okay, I'm gonna check water holes today for that exact reason. I think a lot of animals will be thirsty, but we're gonna send you guys to Mike, whose animals are enjoying some swimming. Well, welcome back. So Lauren was talking about animals uh, seeking shade when it's hot. The other thing they can do is swim. And so we see here the, the, the bulls from that herd we had at the water earlier have stuck around to enjoy a little bit of a you know, guy time. They're just having a bit of a, a play fight in the water with the Kumo just watching over there, making sure they don't get too rough. Look at that one climbing right on top of the back of the other one. No, I tell you what, no logical explanation for doing this apart from just having the best time of their life. Look at that. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's like the elephant equivalent of a fist pump. Just having the best time. So they are, you know, oh, there's Kumo now getting in on the action. He's going to come and join them, maybe. He's starting to walk a bit deeper into the water. So he's much, much larger than these other young bulls. And now he's seen them, you know, mounting each other and pushing. And now I think he's maybe wants to show off some of his strength as well. Not that he needs to. He's literally head and shoulders above them. Um, and the, the other bulls have now actually really started to behave themselves a lot more and they're just acting like the, the one is hiding behind the other one if you look over there it, almost like <laughs> trying to hide away from kumo's uh, stairs his fatherly stairs Ethan has asked, um, who's eight years old, has asked, how do elephants use their tusks and what are they actually for? And Ethan, that's a great question. And it's something that we, you know, see a lot of, is elephants using their tusks to snap branches and twigs. And if you watch what these elephants do, you'll see them pushing, oh, look at that, pushing their heads together. And the tusks often lock in to each other in order so that they don't hurt themselves when they're pushing against each other. But they can also use them as weapons. Uh, often the mothers will use their very sharp tusks to defend their babies if predators come too close, or even large elephants. But many other things, they're, they're, it's, it's the equivalent, it's the same as having a, a tool belt, you know, except it's just one tool. But it does a bit of everything. They can dig, they can scratch the bark off some trees. I'll show you in a moment. There's a tree right next to us which actually has some bark that's been ripped off. Um, and they use them for digging up roots and snapping branches and all sorts of different things. So they're very wonderful tools. Sometimes I wish I had a pair of tusks myself. It seems like there's even more elephants coming down to the water. It's a very busy water hole today. I'm going to end up spending our whole day here. So Ethan, I hope that answered your question. The elephants use their tusks for basically everything. As you can see now, they're using them just to wrestle. Believe it or not, the one elephant is standing up and Kumo is actually sitting down on his back legs. That's how much bigger he is than these other elephants. It's amazing. So I don't know if you noticed that large elephant at the back that I keep referring to as Kumo has got a, a collar on, on its neck. So that's how we can recognize that one. And they use that collar for all sorts of things, uh, for monitoring their movements, part of research. So all the while these elephants are uh, playing in the water, the other herd has been moving off. And every now and again, we see these little quiet rumbles. I don't know if you guys can hear that. They're not very loud. And elephants use something called infrasound, which is basically just sounds so low that we can't even hear them. Oh, a little short there, buddy. Don't think you're going to get on top of that. <laughs> Slip, as, I say as it slips off. This is purely playful behavior. There's really, elephants are one of the few animals that you, oh, it's now a dolphin. 
it's a dolphin element, elephant. So they very rarely, uh, we see animals playing, you know, and we, we can't be sure if it is playing or not, but this definitely looks to me like playing. Of course, it's also important when they push each other around like this. It's, it's part of strengthening not only their social bonds, but also establishing who is stronger and bigger and tougher uh, than the other. And it's a, doing it in the water actually is a bit safer because they don't have their full weight behind them crushing each other and hitting each other. You can just see the other elephants and a warthog in the background wanting to join in. Probably the other elephants are just waiting there because uh, these these rambunctious or very energetic uh, male elephants might be a little bit uh, worrisome for them. They might be worried that they be a bit too aggressive. Amazing how deep the water still is. This uh, water hole used to go all the way up to where the mud is in the background. It covered the whole muddy area. Uh, but even though it's dropped, you know, by about half, it's still deep enough to swallow up a whole elephant. Look at that. It's a little, little elephant island. Z Zoti has asked if, if elephants can swim uh, or if they just walk on the bottom like hippos. Uh, you know, it's quite interesting. I don't know how deep I've ever seen an elephant go into water or whether they walk through water deep enough for them to swim in. Uh, but I assume that an elephant can probably do something of a of a doggy paddle type of thing, but most of the time what, what you're seeing is they're just walking along the bottom, uh, like what a hippo would do. Hippos also can sort of make themselves float a little bit, but they can't swim as such. Well, they don't swim. They probably can, but they don't. Uh, so elephants, yeah, also just walk along the bottom. But I think I, I, I think I read somewhere that they found an elephant crossing to an island somewhere off, off of, I think it was Asia, and this elephant like swam across to this island. So maybe they can swim. I don't know if it would be... Uh, swimming as we think of it, but definitely like a little doggy paddle type of type of scenario Zoti if I ever see it, I'll be amazed. I would love to see it. Oh, we've lost one elephant They're so big, but in this water hole pff, gone <laughs> Amazing uh. Speaking of hippos, there's something quite amazing. Lauren's got a hippo out of water. I was going to surprise you all and tell you these birds were sitting on a log. But it's not a log. We have two red-billed oxpeckers sitting on what could be... Oh, no, there's three, sorry. Could be mistaken as a log, but it is a hippo. This is the hippo from our Gowrie Dam. And for some reason, it's not staying nourished and cool and hydrated in the dam. It came here to a drainage line. This is what a fat sleeping hippo looks like, everyone. Blends in very, very well. Now, the drainage lines are slightly lower and cold air sinks, warm air rises. So it's a lot cooler in the drainage lines on a day like today. And of course, there's lots of shade. So it's the ideal spot. Oh, oh, sorry, that's Mr. Hendry. But I do wonder why he's not in the water. I think it's a male. I think it's a territorial male. But winter is normally a tough time for hippos. You will find males very injured, wounded, sulking, because the water becomes very scarce. In dams, the volume drops and fights start to break out. But this year is slightly different. We have had a lot of water this summer and the dams are still very, very full. Have you got an injury on your snout, Mr. Hippo? Yes, you have. Ouch. That's a small one. Yes, yeah, so it's normally very common to find injured males in winter, but I have to say I'm surprised since the water bodies are all still so full that this one would be sulking from injury. It would surprise me. Hippos love to fight, but they're terrible at it. They're really not good fighters, but they clearly think they are. And they get wounded very easily. Now, what will be interesting to see if any of these oxpeckers, I now see four, go for that wound. Because oxpeckers were always said to assist herbivores by plucking out the ticks, just like I mentioned on the giraffe. But there's new science that said that might actually not be the case. These gorgeous birds can end up 
keeping the wound open to get to the blood promotes an infection and never ever letting the wounds heal which weakens the animal and if the wound is quite severe it could end well it could be fatal so these gorgeous birds are starting to get a little bit a little bit of a reputation for that but it seems none of them are interested in this particular wound on the hippo's snout but they're enjoying sitting on the hippo that's for sure Jim, you're wondering if this is normal behaviour for a hippo. We do see it quite a, quite a bit, but it's not normal, no. Generally speaking, hippos spend all day in the water because they are buoyed up. Yeah, something... Ah, uh, I've got another vehicle coming. We're gonna have to pull out of the way, I'm afraid everyone. I couldn't figure out where that noise was coming from, I'm sorry. But no, it's generally not typical behavior and this hippo's starting to move. So we're just gonna get out of the way. The last thing you want to do is get yourself in between a hippo and the water point. They can be very, very grumpy animals. But they spend all day in the water and then as the sun sets, gets dark, it's getting cooler, they tend to come out the water to forage. So it's not really technically normal. Okay, we're gonna head on to the next water point. And as we do that, we're gonna send you over to Damon. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to and beyond pinda my name is damon and behind the camera this afternoon we've got marcel and following on from this morning where we spent the morning out in the open grassy plains looking for some rhinos we've come back to the plains um, with the hope of trying to find you an elusive black rhino for the afternoon and to start off with we've managed to find <laughs> a herd of buffaloes have a look at all of those faces, all curious, looking at us. Apologies for those uh, technical difficulties. We've still got a lot of awesome elephants. We've got uh, basically another whole herd that started to come down to the water. A whole bunch of bulls and the elephants that were, that were dust bathing got jealous and wanted to come back and drink more water, so they've come back. Um, it looks like these ones have got a bit of mud on their bodies and things, so I think this is the group that was, that was here before. Oh, on the very far left there, you'll see one elephant which has got a ripped <laughs> ripped ear. So that is the one we think is the matriarch of this particular herd. Uh, she's been affectionately nicknamed Ellie Shakees. So it looks like a bit like a keyhole in her ear. But absolutely wonderful to see them still here. They've spent the better part of the whole afternoon just sticking around our waterhole. So let's count. How many elephants are actually here? One, two, three, four. Oh, I mean, I can't even count them all. They're so spread out. But there's got to be at least 30 elephants here. Maybe more. Maybe 40 all spread about there's a few more in the far distance there just slowly making their way down oh, this is the kind of scene which you which you wish you could see when you're on a safari and you are seeing it so it's fantastic i'm so glad that you came to join us here i'd like to s s string up a, a hammock here and just spend the whole afternoon here i'm gonna actually just put a little flag here and say this is this is our spot And there's one elephant there in the middle who's just having a <laughs> just had a big stretch and then a splash nothing wrong with that old buddy see that what they do with they see what it's doing with its legs it's trying to get some momentum to kick itself up again in the water it's not so hard because the water helps their body to get up but sometimes when they're lying on the flat ground it's very difficult for them to get back up again oh yeah not quite finished yet got to get that mud everywhere in all the places you can't reach See how it's got its ears open there, and you can see lots of 
veins and blood capillaries and things. So those actually help to keep that elephant nice and cool. So when it goes into the water and splashes around like this, water splashes all over its ears. What are you doing? It's having a fight with the water, an argument. Didn't like what it said to him. Uh, and once those ears are nice and wet, they open their ears up and the wind blows and helps to cool them down. It's, it's about 30 degrees today. Uh, so it's a very warm day for winter, considering that last night it was about 10 degrees. So it's very, very chilly at night, but nice and hot during the day. It's beautiful. And there's some, some more porpoising going on. These elephants really do think they're dolphins. I think it's amazing. And then, oh, actually, <laughs> should I go, go over to where that uh, elephants are mud wallowing. There's, a, there's one bird, which is quite interesting, which I think you should all see. I think you've all, or a lot of you have seen this bird before. I think it's just off to the right there. There's a hammer cop. Uh, it's very small in the frame. That's just walking towards where the elephants are mud wallowing. Very interestingly, this hammer cop eats uh, frogs and fish and tadpoles and anything that it can find. But right now, the elephants are disturbing everything. So any frogs that were hiding in the mud around there are now having to escape. And the hammer cop is trying to make the most of that. It's so clever. So you'll watch it. Sometimes it'll actually try and disturb the mud with its feet. Um, you know, the frogs are getting it from all sides, unfortunately. They're not having a great day. The frogs are not having a great day. But the elephants and the hammer cop are having a wonderful time. So you often find the the hammer cup uh, rubbing its feet to try and disturb them. Lila, happy birthday. I'm glad you're enjoying this on your birthday. Uh, all the way from Hart Bay, I'm glad you're here able to join us. This is just the, I mean, this would be the perfect birthday, isn't it? What a present to see such beautiful elephants doing their thing. I wonder if it's any of these elephants' birthday today. I wonder, I wonder if anyone would be able to tell that. No, it'd be impossible, but it'd be awesome if we did know. Elephants have great memories. They they remember places and times and you know all sorts of things. You know they're famous for it. I really wonder if if any elephant has ever celebrated a birthday. Oh, there's the one little baby there which has got no tail. Oh, he just popped back in again. There's a little baby elephant in this particular group who's got no tail, which is interesting. I uh, I don't know what might have happened to it, but uh, seems to be doing all right without it. Not suffering any 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 more than it, well, right now it's not suffering at all. It's having the best time of its life in a little bit pile of mud. Hammer cop's still there. Hammer cop's thinking it could be an elephant too. Oh, look. All star, that's a fantastic question. How much do elephants have to drink in a day? I suppose it varies, all star. I suppose some days they might have to drink more if it's very hot and dusty and dry, like today. And some days they drink less if it's nice and wet and the food that they eat has lots of green in it. I suppose, let's talk about a large elephant. Oh, there's a Nyala coming down to, to drink as well. That's awesome. Don't often see Nyalas. Just to the right here, Gerrit. It's We don't have many Nyala uh, in this part of the reserve, so that's really wonderful to see. So... They say that oh, what there was something that I heard, 7% of your body weight per day you have to drink in water. I mean, if an elephant has to ha drink 7% of its body weight in water, that must be hundreds of liters of water every day. Um, so, yeah, definitely. And if I can look at this water hole and how much it's dropped in the last uh, uh, month or so since I was last here, I can see that the elephants have been drinking a lot. So, All-Star, I suppose it depends on the day but certainly a lot, maybe 50 to 100 liters. That's just an estimate. I'll have to look that up. Uh, maybe tomorrow morning I'll have a better answer for you guys. Or if anyone else knows the answer and you can help me answer it, that would be fantastic. Um, I know that each trunk can hold about 10 liters of water, 10 to 30 liters, if the video that I saw yesterday was anything you go by. Uh-oh. Is Kuma having a good scratch there, or is he coming to chase the Nyala? Oh no, he's just having a good scratch. <laughs> yeah, nothing like a butt scratch. That poor, poor leadwood tree. <laughs> and that was the elephant equivalent of a fist bump again. He enjoyed that. Monique, it is a great size comparison. You're right. Uh, these elephants are huge. And it, it's actually much further away than the Nyala. So you can imagine if... if <laughs> trumpeting and all sorts going on the elephants are having 
an absolute, this is an elephant party. Um, and look at that, the, that huge elephant bull just reached up and got a branch. Elephant bulls or elephants are the only animals that can compete with giraffes for how high the leaves that they can get. <clears throat> and as I was saying before, this elephant is much further away than these nyala. If it was standing directly next to these nyala, I don't think they would even come up to its knee. That's how big it is. Oh, it's a very brave nyala though. Not bothered at all by that elephant. I suppose it has no reason to worry. It's not doing anything to the elephant. Oh, never mind. Oh, is he gonna, is he gonna do it? Is he gonna do, oh, go on, get up on your back legs. <laughs> you just see how he lowered his back legs there to try and balance themselves. Elephants are quite top heavy, especially this elephant. You can see it's got a huge head. So if it leans a bit too much in one direction or the other, it'd be very uncomfortable. If it had to do a bit of a face plant. It's amazing to see them reaching up like that. You know, most of the trees are getting very dry now, so the fact that this leadwood still has these beautiful green leaves, it's not what they would normally eat. The leaves are actually quite tough. But because they're still green and probably quite nutritious, they'd rather eat those than, uh, than some of the drier stuff. Well, we are going to keep enjoying this beautiful elephant party, and we'll send you over to James to introduce himself. Good afternoon and welcome. We're on the eastern edge of Juma. And why are we on the eastern edge of Juma, you might ask yourself? Well, because we've come looking for Tandi. And word, I'm afraid, on the radio is that she has been found over there where we cannot go. She's killed an impala and her cub is with her. And I came to check here, just morbidly fascinated as to when she came across. Her tracks are on top of all the vehicle tracks from this morning. And if you look over here, can you see over here, Niels? On my hand, you got it? Okay, that's the cub's track. And so what she did was she came to fetch him. She was obviously in Torchwood this morning. She went, she killed, went out during the middle of the day, came back again with him, and they are now about to sup upon an impala. So she has eluded me once for months more. Uh, we went to check for Morwati, the male leopard. Unfortunately, I think he's taken his kill into some very thick, deep bush. And for those of you who were with us this morning, you will have been privileged to see the magnificence of uh, that leopard doing his kill. And unfortunately, uh, he is very nervous of vehicles and one of the vehicles got very close to him and he took off. I th we'll go back there again sometime during this evening, probably just just before it gets really dark, we'll go back and have a look, but I think he's taken it into some very thick bush. So, our plan is going to be to go down towards Chitwa Chitwa, which is the reserve to the south of us, spend a little bit of time at the water there, maybe we too will have an elephant pool party, uh, I guess... It's almost a sort of morbid relief that Tundi's gone the other side so that uh, she can't continue to elude me. I know where she is. I know I can't see her. And that's the way it is. Anyway, I'm glad she has a meal. I'm glad she and her cub have a meal. For those of you who don't know, Tundi is probably our favorite female leopard. She's 13 years old. She's got a young baby who doesn't have a name yet. Although I will tell you the landowners in Torchwood have called him Wolfgang, which I know will send Twitter into a thromy of heart attacks, uh, aneurysms, hypertension. Anyway, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. Please don't complain. The last time I named something, there was a flood of emails and I got into big trouble. Please don't blame me, it's not my fault. They called him that. I won't call him that, I promise. <laughs> Good. We are going now down to Chit Chitwa and see if we can find something down there. All righty. So 
uh, you have come to us now uh, sitting with this large elephant bull who's been plucking branches from the tree right in front of us, this big leadwood tree, and enjoying them. I really hope that he does something which I've only ever seen once before, which is where they rise up on their back two legs, like what you used to see in circus elephants, you know, on those, on those cartoons like Dumbo and stuff. The elephants rise up on their back legs and reach right up into the tree. Uh, there's still a few branches that are in reach, so let's see, he's going to do it again. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Oh, he's camera shy. Sorry. <laughs> no, we're not watching you, I swear. I promise we are looking everywhere but you. You can do your thing, don't worry. He's got an itchy foot. He's been scratching both his feet on every little piece of rock that, uh, that it could find, uh, or branch, so definitely something is bothering it between its, between its toenails. Oh, no, a little bit too tall. Look, there's another one just to the left. You can reach that one also. Yeah, that way. Gosh, this is amazing. This elephant is so huge. We're up on a bit of a mound here, so we're we're a bit taller than where its feet are. But if if we were at the eye level or at the the level like e even space with this elephant, it would tower above us. This is gorgeous. If you look closely, you can see those long eyelashes on this elephant, which help to protect its eyes when it's feeding on some of those really thorny branches, like what it's feeding on right now. Oh, and look at the beautiful, soft brown eyes on this elephant. Oh, man. So they, I've often heard uh, much more experienced guides than myself talking about elephants having calm eyes, soft eyes. You know, when, when, when you see the soft eyes of an elephant, then you know that you're in a safe, a safe place. I certainly don't feel threatened by this this gentleman at all. He's really, really doing his best to to reach these branches. Um, so, will this elephant's collar be damaged by the water? I don't think so. I think it's it's surrounded by a sort of a hard gel, uh, which protects it like a silicone-based uh, um, seal. So it should be quite safe from the water. But if it's too rough, maybe fighting with other elephants, and then oh, I'm going to talk a bit quiet. He's very close to us, and then um, maybe uh, damages the seal cracks the seal of playing too rough or rubbing against the tree. Oh, wow, look at that in his mouth. I've never seen inside an elephant's mouth before. Um, so if it was damaged, maybe it would it would leak. Uh, but this one, I think, is working just fine. I've never seen inside of an elephant's mouth. That was amazing. <laughs> uh, you know when you yawn and you don't cover your mouth and people always tell you, I can see your lunch. <laughs> this one we really could see is lunch. It was really epic. Man, I'm enjoying this. So you can see his tusks now. We were talking about the tusks being tools before. So when you look at its tusks, you can see these tusks have seen a lot of work. They're quite blunt on the end and rounded. Uh, and that goes to show that they use them frequently to rub against trees and get the bark and get roots and break branches. And often one ele uh, elephants will have one tusk shorter or blunter than the other. So on this particular elephant, it looks like the right tusk is a bit shorter than the left. Look, he's rubbing his foot again. He's really got something that's bothering its foot. I don't want to start my car. He's very close, but I don't want to start my car because it might disturb him, the sound. I'm going to just stay here nice and quiet. And um, yeah, so we're talking about the, the tusks of this elephant and how, so this one, this elephant Kumo has got the right tusk looks a lot shorter than the left one. So it's probably a right-handed elephant uses the right tusk a lot more for the tasks, the daily duties. Oh, that looks good. You can really look at its eyes and how it seems to be just enjoying that scratch. Julian, Julian, who is six years old, is wondering how old elephants get. Uh, that's a good question. And elephants can, if, it depends on which books you read and obviously the area that they live in, but I'd suppose maybe somewhere between 60 and 65 years old would be a very, very old elephant. This particular elephant next to us right now is in his prime. I would suggest this elephant's probably not much older than about 40. Uh, it's a big, broad head, strong, full body. Um, I think he's really maybe even a little bit younger than, than, than 40 but certainly not, not near 60 or anything like that. He is really in a great shape. 
It's beautiful elephant bull. So, yeah, it depends also if they live in a very dry area and they have to eat a lot of sticks and twigs and dry stuff. Their teeth get damaged and then they, uh, they, they when, once their teeth are all damaged, they can't eat so, so easily and then they often, they don't make it too very old. But if they live somewhere with lots of water and green grassy food, then they can live to a very ripe old age, 60 to 65. So if Kumo eats too many of these leadwood branches, which are, you know, some of the toughest branches that you can probably get, uh, it, will, uh, it will damage his teeth. So he's hopefully only going to feed on these now whilst it's very dry. Once the, once the wet season comes again, it will start to feed on the softer, greener grasses. It's a good question, though. I've often wondered... Yeah, this elephant is doing a bit of a moonwalk. I mean, you kind of have to, don't you, to reach up those... Oh, we're looking right in his mouth again. Look at that. Man, oh, man. I am I literally can't believe it. Oh, that's a big brown. I don't know if you're going to fit that all in your mouth. Don't be a pig. Don't be greedy. Don't be greedy. Don't play with your food. Nope, the whole thing, gone. You know, like when... Uh, our students in camp, uh, they, they get themselves a big bowl of spaghetti and they just inhale that thing and it's gone in two seconds. Last night we experienced that and, and uh, this is exactly what old Kumo is doing right now. He's just grabbing whole chunks and all the other elephants are behind as well. I mean, look at that. There's still so many elephants all around. There's one rubbing against an apple leaf tree. There's some playing in the water. We've got a whole bunch still mud wallowing and there's even more further back amongst the trees still coming down. And we've got some little babies breakdance fighting on that damn wall over there. Look at that. Zooming down to chase after everyone else. This is crazy. Be careful when you run over those things. I'll tell you what, that dried, that dried clay can be quite uh, uncomfortable to run over, so you must be careful. Just listen to all the sounds. Well, something disturbed them over there in that corner. You see how all the babies went close to the mothers and there's one opening its ears. Could be that some other creature came along and dis disturbed them, or it could just be that maybe one of the elephants did something another one didn't like, and they're having a bit of an argument now. We'll keep listening a little bit longer. It's beautiful, the sounds. Now, oh, what we're hearing is some... All right, so the kids' session is now officially over, although the kids can still keep sending their questions in, but we're now welcoming questions from everyone. Uh, so please, everyone, please send your questions through, I think, to questions at wildearth.tv. I'm uh, not... Please send us all your questions, please. We love the questions. We love them all. The kids keep watching. There's cool stuff still coming. Hashtag Wild Earth. Please send your questions through to hashtag Wild Earth. Man, the sounds are incredible. Sometimes when it's dark at night and we can't see any of these elephants, we hear these same sorts of sounds, and it's incredible. You can see our camp just in the background there as uh, Akumo just uh, rubs his bum on the tree that he was just eating. That just seems a little disrespectful there, Kumo. But, I mean, fair enough. Look at all the dust coming off. I mean, that's from all the mud wallowing that he was doing earlier. Oh. I don't, he's kind of making eye contact with me. I don't know how I feel about this as he rubs his bum against that tree. Feeling a little awkward. But I guess, I mean, these are the special moments in life, right? It's amazing. You can, you can really see the the dust that's settled all over all over its uh, skin. So you can see these dark and light patches all over its uh, its body. This elephant was a pale grey colour when he first arrived at the waterhole. Now, almost turning, like almost almost black actually, like the the, the colour. Nora, you're right. It is an absolute privilege to be able to experience elephants just like this. The sounds, the sights, everything about it is just absolutely phenomenal. These are truly some of the greatest creatures on Earth. I mean, 
I know they say the lion is the king of the beasts, but I've seen many lions running away from elephants before, so really elephants run the show. And it is a privilege for us to be so close to them. And to... In fact, what's happening right now, we're being let into their life. This isn't us going to the elephants. We literally sat here and these elephants came and did their thing right in front of us. That is literally the greatest compliment that we could be paid as guides, to know that we're being allowed a glimpse into these animals' lives from such an intimate an intimate position. Right, so we're going to be sending you over to Pinda to enjoy some vultures whilst we enjoy this view. Welcome back everyone. Apologies, we've been having some technical issues here, but we are back up and running and we've managed to find a small group of vultures perched up in a dead tree. So, just looking through my binoculars and of course you guys looking through the zoom of the camera, it looks like there's four white bat vultures perched up in that tree and looking pretty comfortable. Look at how they've got their necks pulled into their bodies. They're all puffed up. There's a bit of a chilly breeze that's starting to blow. There's lots of clouds coming in. And it looks like these vultures, just based on where they're perched here, how they're perched high up on that dead tree, it looks like they found their roosting spot for the coming evening. And they would have spent the day soaring on thermals over these vast plains in search of any carcasses on which they could have fed. And the fact that they're all sitting so comfortably up in that tree, not looking particularly interested in anything on the ground. Also, we haven't seen any flying up off of the ground. We haven't heard the sounds of vultures fighting. That tells us that there probably isn't a carcass anywhere nearby. And out on these plains where we are, big trees are in short supply. So wherever there is one, it's prime real estate for these vultures to roost in for the nights. Now, have a close look everybody. I'm just going to ask Marcel to focus on... It's a bit tough to see because of how concealed it is. But if you look into the middle of that tree, the vulture that's lowest down, the one that's somewhat concealed behind a stick there, busy preening itself. I don't know if you can see its head and how white it is when you compare it to the rest of those white back vultures in that tree. And it's not because it's a different species of vulture, it's because it's quite a young vulture. So I'd just like to show you in the bird book here quickly. Have a look over here. So these are all white back vultures and all at different stages of their lives. So it normally takes about five years or so for a white back vulture to achieve this plumage here. This is what the adult plumage looks like. See there's that very distinct black and white on the underside of the wing and that very dark neck and head. Compare that to what they look like in their first year. Look at how streaky they are and see how they've got their neck covered in white flesh. like it's most similar to this one over here just starting to lose the white fluff around its neck and of course these white back vultures will use those long necks of theirs to reach into carcasses to help them to pull out the choicest bits of meat whenever they're feeding on a carcass oh gruesome thought <laughs> We're going to leave these vultures for now everyone and we're going to carry on into the plains to go see if we can find any fresh signs. So I, 
I just want to apologize for our other link. We got that art fox so quickly. Um, it was actually again Jandre that spotted it. <laughs> so it was a bit of a rushed, link, uh, a, a rushed introduction there. But anyway, we're back and we are currently looking at a ground squirrel. What they call a cape ground squirrel. We haven't seen these really nicely on our drives so far. But look how cute that little guy is. So he's out foraging here. And what's interesting is that I'm not seeing any other squirrels around the area. And normally they go in nice colonies. You can get five of them together. Sometimes you can get 20 or 30 of them together. And they often co-inhabit burrow systems where meerkats are. And there's no, there doesn't seem to be any direct competition. These little guys are herbivores. Meerkats are, are going more for insects and um, lizards and scorpions and things. Um, but there certainly will be competition for the actual burrow spaces. So you normally only find those those mixes, squirrels, meerkats, sometimes even yellow mongoose, at the burrow systems that are larger with more, more entrance holes. So just to see this one little guy out here by himself, and I'm not even seeing a burrow system actually anywhere close by us. So. just foraging there and what what we uh, <laughs> Natasha says this is very unexpected she thought it was a meerkat in disguise yeah Natasha you're quite right they're not dissimilar to meerkats in the in their general appearance what what is notably different apart from like the other other features but one thing that is notably different, and unfortunately, I'm just going to pull forward. Let's see if we can get it. But we must look at this big bushy tail that they've got. Whereas if you recall, the meerkats got this long, slender, very, very slender tail that they use for sort of propping themselves up. But let's just pull forward and see if we can actually see this little guy a bit better. We have got an astonishing sighting here of two wildebeest, not one, but two of them here on the great plains of Chitwa Chitwa, where grass is growing, bushes are losing their leaves, virtual starlings are squawking, and these wildebeest are scratching themselves. Wonderful. The silence is almost deafening. In the best possible way, that is. And it really is not a sound, but for the odd hoof fall as they walk a swish of the tail and a slight hum from the back of the vehicle, but that's absolutely it. And a fly. Zzz. It's a delicious afternoon for midwinter. <laughs> hmm. Owen, this is why kids' questions are the best questions. Do I think that prey animals are afraid when they see their own reflections? No, I don't think so, Owen, because they must see their reflections when they drink. They must see themselves, whether they know that's themselves or maybe because it's in water and it's moving around a bit, they don't really acknowledge it, I don't know. 
but no, I don't think that they're afraid of themselves. We know that birds, when they see their own reflections, Owen, can react in a way that doesn't indicate that they're afraid. They get quite angry because they think that there's another bird trying to get to their territory, get in on their territory. So they don't get afraid. They definitely see their reflections as other birds. Not all birds do that. I think crows are able to recognize that they're actually looking at themselves in the mirror. But things like hornbills and barbets uh, spend a lot of time fighting with glass if they can see their reflections. I don't think that it's the same with prey animals like this. And Owen, you might like to know how on earth you can tell whether an animal is looking at itself or, or realizes that it's looking at itself. And one of the ways they do that is they'll put something like a drop of pink paint on the head of the animal that they want to test. And then they put a mirror in front of that animal. And if the animal is able, or maybe not on the head, somewhere where they can reach, if they then touch that pink piece on them, then they know that the animal is recognizing that it's a reflection and not another animal. See what I mean? I don't think a wildebeest would do that. I think if you somehow manage to put a lion mask on the wildebeest without the wildebeest knowing that it had a lion mask on and then put a mirror in front of the wildebeest, then I think it would totally freak out. Right, Mike's pool party has now turned into a mud party. Mud party has now turned into a dust party. As you can see, there's all these elephants are having the time of their life throwing dust all over each other and themselves and also having a bit of a wrestle they look like gladiators in an arena and these are all the young males from those herds which were here earlier that have been left behind now to uh, you know play fight with each other and and test their skills and get stronger you know often the mothers in the herds do not like this kind of behavior it's too rough especially with the babies around so these these young males that are all very you know aggressive with each other and rough with each other. Oh, there's a tusk up the bum. Ouch. Um, will we'll be allowed to play as to their heart's content now. And then when they're finished playing, they'll go and join up with the, with the herds again. You know, a lot of these elephants are actually at the age where, well, most of them have been already removed from the herd, but some of the younger ones might still be part of the herd or at least shadowing the herd. Remember, elephants, uh, the males, usually get chased away by the mothers when they reach... Um, they're sort of mid-teens. The light is so amazing with these elephants throwing dust on each other. I wonder if they ever get uh, dust in the eyes. Well, no, we talked about those long eyelashes, which would probably also help. We can't show you the eyelashes from this distance, unfortunately. We're on the other side of the dam, um, but it's really nice for us to be able to look at them um, from a distance without disturbing them at all. Because these younger elephants are often quite keen to show off their strength to, well, to each other as you can see right there, and to the vehicles. So being a bit further away means that they are doing their thing without any sort of other interruptions. That is sassy Cathy. That is a, that is a question that I've often asked myself. Do elephants fear other animals? And if they did, which one would they fear the most? I mean, I think we always see on cartoons and things that they get afraid of mice. And I've definitely seen that before. I've seen little things running in the grass in front of elephants and they get a big fright. Uh, but I don't think, I think they're not really afraid of them except that it just gives them a bit of a, a you know, like a jump. Uh, I think probably larger elephants I often see when a big male saunters into the group. Uh, you'll hear screaming and screeching and elephants running away. Uh, so they don't think they fear each other, but they've definitely got a healthy respect for the larger elephants because, of course, nothing stops an elephant from getting its way when it really wants to, especially if it's a very big one. But, of course, I've seen elephants also chasing 
predators. They do not like any predators anywhere near them, especially if they've got youngsters. So this herd with all the baby elephants would have definitely been very, very protective and would have chased away lions, leopards, hyenas, wild dogs, anything that has teeth and eats meat would have been chased away. So it's very, very important uh, to remember that uh, when there are predators in a situation close to elephants, that you must be very careful because you never know uh, which direction are these animals going to start running and chasing each other around. But they are certainly uh, very, very uh, wary of predators, but not, not afraid, I don't think. I don't think elephants are afraid of anything, to be honest. I hope that answers your question, Sassy Cathy. Now everything seems to be calming down. The elephants have played, they've dust bathed, they've drunk lots of water. And now it's time to start making their way up into the, the low hills around Pridelands in order to do some last minute feeding before they find a place to settle down. I think it might be windy again this evening, so they might even choose somewhere uh, which is a little bit sheltered to rest. They've got big ears, so they don't like the wind very much. Right, so whilst these elephants make their way up into the hills, we'll send you off to another beautiful scene. So this is slightly morbid, but still very, very interesting. What we got is an old leopard kill, well, what appears to be an old leopard kill of a grey diker hanging in the street. There we go. You can see it there nicely. It's not fresh at all. When I say it's old, this thing is, this is like a mummy and it is bone, bone, bone dry. You know, it's just like goes to powder. The wind's blowing straight towards me. Um, but it's a grey diker and it's a little, it's a little male grey diker. It's got tiny little horns. So this was a youngster. And um, very, very typical of leopard. Um, we had it on the, on the drive this morning, um, leopard killing a, or going for a, a warthog. And we've seen it before where they just take these kills up trees. In this environment, it's no different. Um, a lot of brown ahina out here. So this leopard would have been very, very quick to get this to a tree and up. Brown ahina and leopard, although you know, even with even a leopard male, that 80, 90 kilograms sometimes, um, it's still possible for brown ahinas actually just to mob them and chase them off the kill. Sometimes even a single brown ahina. So the best option here for these cats is just get it up a tree, get it out of reach. I once, um, years ago, I set up two camera traps. Um, I got a leopard on an impala kill, and so I thought it would be fun to set up a camera trap in the, in the tree and on the ground. Um, and anyway, the one on the ground disappeared, and it took myself and some researchers like two two days to find it. These brown hyenas had carried it away. But on those cards, there were over four and a half thousand images of a leopard sitting in the tree, just snarling and growling and feeding, and two brown hyenas on the ground, just looking up, waiting for something to fall. So, so brown hyenas, absolutely, although they're not in the same league as spotted hyenas, a brown hyena will never go for a lion. It'll never try to harass a lion, but spotted hyenas will. Um, but certainly with brown ahinas and leopards, it's brown ahinas hands down every day. So, um, but you know, so that's just interesting to note that we, that's something cool that we spotted. Um, and we're just going to keep ambling down and see, maybe we'll be luckier than another art fuck. Hello everyone. Welcome back to and beyond Pinda. Just before I continue, I just want to give you all a warning. If you are sensitive, this would be a good time to look away. We have come up onto this hillside and come upon quite a somber scene in a very, very small zebra foal that has unfortunately lost its mother. And that is obviously mom lying there. She we're not quite sure what's killed her. We're not able to see her face. It doesn't appear that she was attacked by a predator. Um, but what is clear is that this little foal is not wanting to leave her side. And see what it's doing there. It's busy sticking its, its nuzzling kind of where her, her teats are, trying to suckle from her. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's obviously quite a quite a traumatic scene to see, and I can only imagine what it's like for this little zebra foal. Now the rest of his, we presume to be his harem, is nearby. Um, the har the harem stallion, in fact, is pretty close to him right now, just to the left of him, busy feeding. But at that young age, that foal is definitely going to need milk, and just a diet of grass is not going to not going to do it for him. There's the stallion. Invariably, the, the father of this little this little foal. Yeah. So while this is very sad to see and difficult to watch, it is important to remember that this is nature. And while this, while it's very sad that this mare has passed away and that uh, this little foal is left without its mother. When do you say it's heartbreaking? I can't agree with you more. When it is very 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 difficult to to watch to be honest um, but like I was saying it, it is necessary that this happens and remember we saw all those vultures a little bit earlier this while this zebra mare has passed away she, her body will provide food for countless other animals like those vultures that we saw up on the tree oh shame this poor little thing lying down next to mum It'll be interesting to see how long the rest of the family group does stay here with this little one or around this area. Unfortunately, I have not heard of any cases or read of any cases where where other zebra mothers will suckle a foal that isn't theirs, so it doesn't look that good for this little guy. Nicolene, you're asking maybe a snake bite? Nicolene, that is, that is possible. Um, like I said, we haven't had a good look at the body. Um, we can't really see much more than what we can see from here. And to get out of the vehicle and approach it would, would be, yeah, we wouldn't do that, obviously, because it'll be very traumatic for that little foal. But a snake bite, I suppose, perhaps she got kicked by another zebra in the head. Um, perhaps she was sick. Disease is a possibility. Shame, little one. Yeah, it will be interesting to see what happens. I think we're gonna leave this little one and wish it all the best. Um, but in the meantime, though, we're gonna try and find something a bit more upbeat. And I know that James has found something uh, to cheer you up, so we'll send you across to him. We do. We have got two wild hounds, wild dogs, painted wolves. I'm sorry if the picture's a bit jumpy. Apparently there's not much we can do about that right now, especially while these dogs are lying where they are. But maybe they'll move a little bit later and things will improve somewhat. That is a very disturbingly sad and miserable scene with a zebra. And while you might wish it luck, whew, there ain't no luck for that, is there? That's a one-way ticket to nowhere. How very sad. Anyway, we'll hope that these dogs have a happy afternoon. They've certainly eaten something very large during the course of the morning. I'm not sure what it was. I also don't know to whom these guys belong. I'm sure James Richard will be on it immediately. I don't think they're members of the Pungwe Pack, AKA the Investic Breakaway Pack. I think that's what they were called. They're the ones with the babies up in the den, uh, just north of the Sabi Sand. And they're quite nice. They're not too restful, which is great. 
So they are moving around a bit. I'm not sure they're going to get up and do any hunting anytime soon, but I think we're going to wait and find out. We're not going to drive off from them today. <laughs> and a wonderful discovery of them. We came, we came driving down this road and I suddenly heard Niels muttering with great enthusiasm. I thought he'd been spiked in the head by a thorn or something like that. And actually what he was saying was, Valona, Valona, meaning wild dogs, wild dogs. <laughs> and so they were. I didn't see them. Well done, Niels. 25 points for you. Yeah, and many of you agreeing that this is the chair you needed off that very sad picture of nature with a poor little zebra. wonder how its mother died. Perhaps it was the dangerous activity of birthing. Now, because we're a bit closer to water, it's a bit more sound here. So we've got some crickets. We've got a couple of birds next to the water. The old hippo going It's very poor arena. I believe that the highest, one of the biggest litters ever recorded was 24 puppies. The average is probably closer to uh, 12. 12 is pretty normal. Sometimes it's fewer than that. I'd say the survival rate is less than 10%. Let's move a little bit, simply because we can, and I think that it's going to make a difference to our signal if we get up onto the left bank here. The left bank. Sounds like I'm describing a wine blend. Where I know I've done pigments before over the course of years. Let's go across to Lauren. She's got something also. I have a squirrel. There's actually two, but I don't quite know where the second one's gone. And for me, Squirrels are the most entertaining animals you can get out here. Highly entertaining and very, very naughty. We have a lot of animals that come into our camp. Swazi being the main culprit. But the squirrels are just as naughty. They'll come into your bedroom and they have learned exactly where everything is in the kitchen. They know the big box of nuts that we have. They know how to access the nuts. And they know where the berries are. Hmm. Squirrels know exactly what they're doing. And considering they only weigh about 200 grams, they eat a lot. Very smart. And marula trees are the perfect sort of spot for these tree squirrels to hang out. Once that sun starts to set, They'll do exactly what dwarf mongoose do. They'll run to the nearest cavity, the nearest hole, the nearest den, and sleep for the night. Now, I think our leopards snack on squirrels more than we even realize. All throughout the night, throughout the day, I think things like squirrels are an easy snack. 
I don't think they would be very fulfilling. But I think our leopards snack on them more than we realize. It just goes down in one gulp. Now, for those of you who are maybe wondering about the hyenas, I just want to give you an update. They have definitely moved, definitely moved. I have checked every single day and they're not there. I have been to all the other dens that we know about and for any of our long-standing viewers, that means Gwen's den, Aubrey's den, Vubu den, Shibamu den, Zoe's den, and Gallagher Shortcut Den. If that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry. All it means is that I have checked a sort of regular known dens that the hyenas use. So I'm a bit baffled to say the least, but I'm not gonna give up. I need to find Ribbon and I need to find our little her little cubbies. We will, we will find them. You've just got to put the groundwork in. You've got to look and one day they will appear. They may even appear, or should I say reappear, back at den number three, the original one. They were maybe just giving it a break to sort of air out, get rid of any moisture, any parasites. So we'll keep looking. As I bumble on down to Treehouse Dam, we're gonna send you across to Dylan and an aardvark. We've got another aardvark. Second one, second one for the afternoon. Um, I think I'm, you can just see it sticking out there or not. I can't see it. I'm just going to roll forward a fraction. I'm just going to go forward a fraction, yeah? Don't go anywhere, don't go anywhere, don't go anywhere. Just wait, wait, wait. This is really, really, really good. It's, it's just in that clump of, just to the right of that tree. Go a little bit further back, Chandra. No, back, further back to your right. Go right. And now straight, straight in there, in the middle between those big trees. A little bit left, a little bit left. It's straight in there, yeah. It's, it's at the base of that bush. Okay, we're just going to have to be patient here a little bit. Um, we might actually, okay, there, 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 he's out in the open. There you go. Jeez. He was giving me like heart palpitations there. Look at that digging. This is insane. Two art fork in less than an hour. But the key thing here is this, this, these big, beautifully grassed areas are very, very, very good for ants and termites. And that's the only reason we're seeing this density of, of art fork in this area. If you're not having this grass cover, you don't, you don't get the density of ants and termites. And that means you don't get the ant eating animals. Joe's commented how big they are. Yeah, these can get to 40 kilograms. Sometimes, sometimes some, some literature even says more than 40 kilograms. I'm just so chuffed about this. He might actually come right around into the open towards the front of the vehicle over here. The hearing is exceptional, as you can imagine, with those long ears. So I'm always a little bit, I'd always err on the side of caution um, in terms of starting the vehicle and moving. Um, the wind is still in our favor, so it's, it won't be too bad, but I'd rather just give it the benefit of the doubt and see if it moves across our front before actually starting the vehicle up again. And what's very interesting to see this one, that is facing us now, that is gorgeous. Look at that. What's interesting with this one is I'm not seeing birds in attendance. Very often you get a number of different bird species that I actually wanted to chat about as well. Um, that other art fog pulled such a quick blind on us. Um, but I think we're gonna I think we're gonna get a really, really nice visual when he moves around to the front of you. I'm not gonna ask Jandre to move the camera there, but I'm just gonna mention I see there's a hornball, a yellow billed hornball moving in from the left. Um, so this is like one of those quandaries that you do you pull the vehicle forward or do you wait? I think we're gonna wait rather. Let's let's just do as little little disturbance as possible. Yes, I can't believe it. A two art fork in less than an hour. This is, this is awesome. Yeah, I think we're just gonna stick here and hope that he comes out from behind this bush. Oh, 
Our hounds have not moved. They remain, well, relatively active. Now, James Richard has told us that they're part of the Sands breakaways. In other words, they broke away from the Sands pack some time back. Thank you, James. I knew you'd know. Without you, I'd have to make up half the things I say. Without Judy H, I'd have to make up the other half as well. So lovely how they're just not like lions at this time of the day. You know, they're not... They don't sit around... Totally comatose. Yes, they're not running around hunting, but they're up and they're looking and they're beautiful all the time. Not to mention smelling as well. Now, the one with the ripped ears is, can hear something. Lying in the last patch of sunlight that's going to fall on this little bit of dry riverbed. After which it's going to get a bit cooler and they may get up and move. Alternatively, they could just go and find another patch of sun, I suppose. Hmm. <laughs> Tom the Baker, they do look like very pettable dogs, I would agree with you. You'll find that they are not, in fact, pettable, though. If I got out of the car now and tried to give them a tickle, they'd run away. Scandalous that that might seem, it is true. Now, what's also interesting is that I believe attempts have been made to domesticate them, probably not very strong attempts, but even puppies raised you know, in rescue centres and that sort of thing, tend to start to wander. They don't tame properly like a, you know, like a domestic dog does. I don't think there's another member of the pack in there. I'm not sure why he's wandering off. Let's wait and see what his mate does. He's definitely still there behind the bushes on the little track. You see, that one's heard, keeps the one of those torn ears, keeps hearing something. is not moving from the very comfortable bed of straw, soft straw. Yes, it is, Cindy, you're right. The silence of the afternoon is deafening for this hound. This is an incredibly quiet afternoon, it really is. Not unpleasantly so. And you can see from the size of that one's belly that a very fine meal was enjoyed this morning. A good Sunday brunch. This is quite an afternoon we're having. Let's go up to Ngala now, where I believe Barney has had some spotted success. The hard work of running around, following tracks to bushbacks, alarm calling, and eventually led us into finding this beautiful young male up a tree, successful with a bushback. Having a feast for the afternoon, he 
has been feeding for quite a while. It looks like he at least had most of the hindquarters. There is still quite a lot of that carcass left. But it looks like he might have caught this thing earlier on today. Because if you look closely at where he's feeding, there's a lot of flies buzzing around. He's found such a beautiful spot for himself in a hot Sunday afternoon to be nice on the shade and a very beautiful jackalberry tree where he's managed to balance his carcass so perfectly and he's feeding like he knows that somebody else is going to come and steal it from him. So the possibilities are, there's so many possibilities of something else coming here. We're not too far from where the bride had the buffalo. We saw a lot of hyenas there. And the bride walked past this area earlier on today. But wherever they are now, they look, might still be sleeping. So I don't think that that thing that's the least of his worries. So he's trying to eat as much of this carcass as possible because he never knows if somebody bigger will come and chase him off and lose the carcass. You look at that beautiful bloody face. Looking at that bloody face, pink nostril, young maid. It looks like a young maid leopard that we have named Mark Koti maid who lives the sick dense river in areas not too far, his territory is not too far from the Timbavati river bed itself. He suddenly became, he grown, he's, he's grown in the last while quite quickly, but he's become quite brave where, for his age, where he is maybe close to two and a half somewhere there, he's just starting to rasp and mark his territory. That's not always a great idea for him to be doing because he is still quite young. He is still in his father's territory. But his father has got such a big territory that sometimes he'll be gone for weeks before we spot him. And as we speak today, I don't think we've seen him in the last two to three weeks or so. So this young man at this moment in time, he, after this nice big meal, he is taking good care of himself and it looks like he's gonna make him gain more and more courage to carry on do what he does best, which is rasping around and walking parallel to this riverbed and he's already started patrolling his territory. And if you ask me, I would think this guy started quite early to do that. Look at that. Looks like he got a little bit of a bone that he needs to get rid of. Otherwise it might not go down too well. It looks like he's managed to break it and then it's gone. Look at how long is that tail. You can see every now and again he moves around positions and he stops feeding and looks around just to make sure that he doesn't concentrate too much on the one aspect and forget about safety. Sherana, indeed, I don't think you can ask for a better branch right now to be on with the carcass and be feeding in a tree in this late afternoon. It's... So he looks like he's still going to gorge himself for a while. There is a chance that he, if he's got a full base, most likely to lie next to the branch, or he might even come down, take us to go have his afternoon drink. So let's stick with him and see what he's going to do. Well, everyone, I promised that we'd find something more joyful after that very sad scene with that zebra foal. And I think two cheetah cubs with their mother, with the most insane sunset in the background, will do just fine. Look at that. One of the youngsters just stretching a little bit. And he's decided that he wants to go behind that bush. <laughs> but there is mum and one of the other youngsters lying still in the long grass. And they are literally in the dead center of a massive open patch of grassland. Now, with that sun setting, 
this mother cheetah is going to want to find a safe place for her and her youngsters to spend the night. Oh, look at that stretch. <laughs> look at the toes. So she'll be wanting to find a safe place for her and her youngsters to spend the night somewhere nice and open so that she can use or that so that she can detect any potential danger early on and warn her youngsters and so that they can move away quickly if need be and this spot we're in is perfect Debbie you are more than welcome you say cheetahs always make you smile Debbie they always make me smile too especially when they when it's little ones like this and it's Oh, there's mum. Look at how the baby's got its paw on mum's back. The little cheetah cub's got its legs stretched out across mum's shoulders. Obviously super comfy. Yeah, so mum has done very well to find them this spot. And even just looking at her body language, look at how relaxed she is. Look at how her eyes keep closing. For a mother cheetah to do that when she's got two little youngsters to look after, she's got to be, got to be pretty feeling pretty secure. And very often, a mother cheetah with her with with youngsters like this will be super twitchy and nervous, and every little sound, sound, every little noise will make her jump up and look around. So for her to be looking that relaxed going into the evening, she's done well. Okay, we're going to try for another view to try and get all of them in frame. Um, in the meantime, we'll send you to some other babies. Well, little is not the word I would use. We have a ginormous roadblock in the form of great big grey pachyderms. We do have a little one at the front there. Very, very young calf. <laughs> Hello. Still get into grips with its trunk, I think. Elephants really do take time to learn how to use their trunk. It's such a complex organ. No bones. Lots and lots of muscles in muscle bundles. It takes a lot of coordination. So we often say when elephants are in the water, ah, they're having a whale of a time. I think Emma said it earlier, actually. But they're not related to whales in any way, shape or forms. The elephant's closest relative is the rock hyrax, believe it or not, and manatees. Manatees, in case any of you don't know, are, I think they get called sea cows. You should Google them. They look like big, fat, blubbery sea cows. Dugons are very similarly, similarly related to manatees, the closest relatives of elephants. So you have some very closely related groupings of animals. You have elephants that we call pachyderms. And then you have cetaceans, which are your whales and dolphins. There you, then you have sirenia, that we call pachyderms. And then you have cetaceans, which are your whales and dolphins. There you, then you have sirenia for the manatees and dugons. And they're all closely related, but very separated along the lines of evolution. So I'm not actually sure I can go anywhere at the minute, but you guys are going to pop over to the Advark. This is the most incredible art fox hunting. He walked right across the road in front of us and now he's just digging. We are so close to him. We 
they're about 30 meters. I've got to talk very softly so we don't frighten him away. The wind has also dropped and it's just swirling very gently so he might pick up our scent at any moment. But this is absolutely incredible to watch this. My goodness, this is just off the charts for me. Yeah, I'm happy if I see one hot fog in, in a month. Two in one drive is incredible. But like in the open like this, wow. I'm actually stunned that he hasn't detected us yet. Because he was moving away from us and then suddenly he just started angling straight back towards us. I think even Chandra's happy, it's like a cameraman's dream with her backlight. Look at those ears, look at that nose. Clarissa, totally, you're totally right. Absolutely stunning, stunning, stunning. And now there's some birds also coming in. The anti eating chats are starting to look where he's foraging. We're not going to cut to them. Um, we're just going to keep watching where this little hot fog goes. Oh, look, there's a bird. There's a bird right at him, right at him. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Oh, this is just fantastic to watch this. So those little anteating chats, they, they don't only eat ants, they'll eat anything that he unearths. So if he's digging up little worms and grubs and caterpillars, they'll go for them as well. And obviously also the ants that he goes for. What an afternoon. What an afternoon. And our colleagues are also having just these incredible sightings. So, yes, I'm so happy. Sure, 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 sure. We're just going to spend as much time as we can with this hot fog and see what if he comes towards us or moves away. We're still with our little family of cheetahs. We've just moved around a little bit to try and get a better view of them. So we've got mom on the right and one of the youngsters just out of sight to her right and then this youngster in the foreground busy grooming itself now having a look at these two youngsters it looks like it's the same two that you saw a couple of days ago with Marcel and Clive when they were eating that impala so the little one closer to us tough to see now because you can't see them both together but he's got a little bit of a bigger head a little bit kind of more thickly built so that identifies him even at this young age as a male and then his sister like we said can't quite see her just yet she's a bit more petite a bit smaller and skinnier and have a look while he's grooming himself have a look at the back of his neck everyone look at how light and fluffy he is and that comes from when him and his sister were born they would have been covered, uh, at least along their backs, in the shock of white uh, or very pale colored hair that would have helped them to blend into the long grass. And because of that, so there's that shock of very light colored hair on their backs that fades with, or it grows, kind of falls out as they get older. Um, and it kind of remains for longest on the, the scruff of the neck where we can see it there. But as I was saying, so when they're born, that shock of white hair on the back, and then they, their bellies, the spots are very close together. So they look quite two-toned almost, almost a bit like a honey badger. And there are some, some that, that, or some scientists that speculate that perhaps that might be a survival strategy for young cheetah cubs by looking like a fearsome honey badger. They might be able to avoid 
getting or they might be able to deter predators from coming towards them. Okay, so we're gonna spend some more time with our young cheetah and see what they get up to. In the meantime, let's see what James's wild dogs are up to. I'm spending time with my dogs, one of whom is looking after the other one who's decidedly less restful. Uh, the one that we're looking at now has got a belly so round that it's a surprise she can breathe. Here comes the other one. Perhaps, oh no, I know, going back to sleep. Let's go to the other one, Niels. He's biting bushes. Looks like he's thinking about perhaps coming down here. I'm hoping they're going to go for a drink and we'll have them in the gorgeous light. at the moment no joy i haven't seen the fat one stand up yet so i'm not sure if she's a female or a male i think she's a female i've just kind of seen her roll over quickly then you see any equipment that would suggest that she carries a y chromosome The other one's now running off. Right, people, hold on to your hats. Yeah, that's a female. I must say, Neil said, do you think she looks like she's got puppies? And I said, no, because she doesn't, you know, she doesn't have those very heavy milk sacks. Apologies, James had some technical problems while he's rushing, rattling through the bush trying to keep up with the dogs. I know the feeling is understandable. It's quite an exciting thing to see. However, we back with our young male leopard at Ngala who has been feeding for quite a while. Looks like he's had enough for now. He has climbed slightly higher up from where he was feeding. As you can see right now, He's making that trip look way too comfortable for my liking. Using one of his arms as a pillow, both his legs and the tail dangling from either side of the branch and panting quite fast, trying to digest as quickly as he can. He looks like he's gonna be in this position, panting as he is doing now, trying to digest as fast as possible so that when there's a little bit more space in his belly, He's most likely to come down and fill himself up a little bit more. He will try throughout the night to stay on his fullest capacity. Just for in case he happens to lose this carcass, at least he walks away with a full belly. So every now and again, as fast asleep as he looks now with a full belly like that, these guys never, never go into a deep sleep like we do. At the moment, there is nothing, no sounds that would disturb him, or that sounds like it's a little bit of a threat for him. But if he is to hear anything moving around underneath the tree, or a, a leopard roaring, or anything like that, that could be a potential danger to his life. He will be up and about very, very quickly, and just make sure that he knows where the sound is coming from, just to make sure what he, his plan of action will be. So looking at how higher up and how nice and dark, looking from the picture of where he's sleeping, he is trying to get as close as possible to the canopy of the tree, just so that he doesn't get the sun and see the sun is still a little bit warm. Today for a winter day, 
it was typically, it was quite warm. So I think he throughout the day, he suffered through that sun as well. And after having a full belly now, I think he needs a little bit of a shade to cool himself off. And so why he got as close as possible to that canopy. So the tray is slipping on is one of, oh, we are not too far from the Timawati riverbed. And this is called the Jekyll Berry tree. Beautiful, beautiful specimen. Look at the trunk, it's really, really thick and with multiple branches where you slip it. The MGN, beautiful shade indeed. And looking at where he's sleeping right now, getting the proper shade that he needs. Uh, he doesn't look like he's going to be going anywhere anytime soon. A little bit of a head shake there, maybe some flies are bothering him after... Having a little bit of a bloody face, he tried to clean himself a little bit, but it didn't really take too much time, so he might still have some little bit of blood here and there that the flies will be attracted to. And right now, all he wants is just to rest and maybe change a little bit of position and make himself look a little bit more comfortable than he looked earlier. Look at how long that tail is, how he straightened, straightened the tail now going parallel to the branch. Slightly different to letting it dangle on the side. Maybe he's just getting his balance right. Maybe the tail and his back left leg was starting to put a little bit of weight, which might be why he kept on correcting. It looks like now he's just figured out another plan of how to balance himself properly out there. Let's see how long that tail is going to stay in there. It doesn't look like it's going to be able to stay there that long. It's coming back down. Does look like the tail has got... It looks like he is... The tail has got its own life. It just goes back where it wants to be. Let's stick around with him while we have a little bit of light to see what he might do or what might happen here. Because maybe, you never know, maybe some hyenas might come. Maybe we can get a little bit of interaction, so let's hang around. Wild Earth relies on support from viewers like you to carry on broadcasting our daily live shows. A small donation goes a long way in helping us on our mission to connect the world with nature. Please visit our support page to see how you can help and become part of the Wild Earth family. We're still with our three cheetah. We've just moved ever so slightly so that we can actually see all of them together. And is that not just so precious? So there on the far right is that little young male. See mom fast asleep in the middle with her son's tail draped over her shoulders. And it looks like he just hit her in the head with his butt. <laughs> very rudely awakened. And then if you look very carefully on the left-hand side of your screen, you can just see her nose and her little tear marks coming down from her eyes to her mouth. There is the little female resting also with her chin on her mom's rump. Look at how closely they're all huddled together, keeping warm on this chilly evening. It just shows how strong their bond is as well between this mother and her two youngsters. Now, quite an amazing story that these two youngsters have in that they were born not far from here and their mother, when they were old enough, started to Look how the youngster's grooming mom's ear. <laughs> he just battered her in the face with his paw. <laughs> Not very nice. Before I get into the story, everyone, I just wanted to let you know. So we had a careful look. This young male got up a few minutes ago and just repositioned himself to find a more comfy spot to lie. And it looked like his belly was pretty empty. So I wonder, I wonder if his belly's empty. Mom's belly must be pretty empty too. So. This might be something for us to come and look for tomorrow morning. I don't think she's going to try to hunt anything now. Obviously, getting into the dark of night, a mother cheetah with the, her youngsters is going to want to just stay put and rest and rather be as vigilant as possible for any signs of approaching danger. But tomorrow morning, 
is a new day and if he's hungry then chances are his sister's hungry and that mom is hungry too so maybe tomorrow morning they'll go and try and find something to eat but coming back to the story so mom when or when these cubs were born there were four of them um, four little cubs all together and one evening mom moved them um, across one of the roads and into a new area and the next morning when we found them again there were only two cubs and we were all absolutely mortified because we found lots of fresh lion tracks in the area and so we were worried that or we our hearts all sank and we believed that that two of the cubs had been killed by lions in the night um, and we made the decision to leave mom alone and leave the whole area alone so no one was allowed to drive anywhere close just in case the cubs were still alive maybe hiding in an aardvark hole and calling to mom to come and rescue them after their escape from the lions and luckily that is what happened and after giving them two two days we came back to the area and it still seemed like one youngster had been killed but at least there were still three as opposed to the two initially unfortunately since then it seems that mom has lost another one of her youngsters but these two look super fit and super healthy and they are just coming past i think they're about six or seven months now if i'm not mistaken and from here on their chances of survival are going to get better and better as they go so mom has done very well to keep these two alive keep them fed in what is a very dangerous world for a little cheetah cub and she's moved them over pretty much the entire expanse of the reserve and has taken them from here in the far south up into the far north where for many months we didn't see them at all and we presume that that is when the third youngster disappeared but now she's brought them back to pretty much where they were born and we're hoping that she sticks around in this area and that we'll be able to find her and her youngsters and follow their story from here watch the youngsters grow in the coming months maybe even watch them learn how to hunt later on in the year wouldn't that just be fantastic look at how restless this little male is He's obviously got an empty belly and wants mom to go and prepare dinner but we're going to spend a bit more time with these cheetah and just take it all in as the sun starts to set behind us and we'll let you know if anything changes we just got this magnificent sable bull over the dune which is like as murphy likes doing just tucks himself away and <laughs> when we stop to start getting him um, but i'll tell you a little bit about sable br briefly we're right on the edge of their natural distribution this would be about their the furthest western limit um, and it probably historically would have been 10 years at best um, so they kind of do okay yeah they don't do brilliantly but they do okay um, and he's yes he's really pulled a blind on us now but just slapping himself straight behind that bush there so sable are actually mixed feeders they'll feed on on um, leaves and twigs as well as grass so that's oh, there, thank heavens he came out that's a magnificent bull eh? wow 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 and there are many many records of sable actually killing predators that go for them including lions and it used to be a species that occurred abundantly in many areas of south africa um, Oh, he's just going to lie down. But yeah, they used to occur over a massive area of South Africa. And just, in fact, they were so common in some places that they, they were actually uh, shot for rations by people. I mean, can you imagine that? And now there's actually relatively few parks that you can go to and still see decent populations of sable. So that was, that was just a nice one. I, don't, I think we might have seen one on the, one of the drives at some point. But um, it was just really nice to see this one. Eh? Thank you. Mind blown by the horns. It's like, 
Yeah, that's what I like to hear. You know, it's not just like another animal and it's a, it's pretty. But, I mean, these are super magnificent animals. And I think sable are, have got to be one of my favorites. Sable, bushbuck, eland, blue diker. Ooh, that's a good one. Kreisbok, there's lots of them. But sable are one of my favorites. <laughs> It's like, I've got lots of favorite things, but I'm just so, I'm just so stoked. I mean, you got two art fog, a beautiful sable, a leopard kill, okay, not fresh, but still. Um, and I think we're just going to amble our way into this incredible landscape over here and um, maybe we can find something else for you. So let's keep, let's keep ambling on. Yes, this is awesome, man. So this boy has not moved much since the last time. He looks like he needs his rest. Maybe that will help him grow a little bit quick. So looking at how much of that carcass is still left, uh, chances are that it will still be in this exact same tree tomorrow morning. He might come down maybe in the evening to go have a drink somewhere. But right now, it doesn't look like much will change. So what we were thinking of doing, remembering how where we left our lions, Birmingham Pride, this morning. And since it's cooling off quite quickly and the sun is about to set, after sleeping the whole day in that area, if they are still there, which I hope they will, it might be worth a while after finishing off with this guy here and let him sleep a little bit more to go check it out and see if they have managed to start waking up, if they're getting ready for the afternoon. They might not wake up too quickly because remember they also just walked away from a buffalo that they finished this morning sometimes. However, they might want to go and have a drink somewhere, move around a little bit more or even try to find the young male that we're talking about. I think that might be something for one of us to go find out if they are will be willing to do any of that. After finishing up with this guy who doesn't look like he's gonna go anywhere anytime soon. Did well for himself though. The carcass is nicely secured. And right now he's taking a break when nothing else can get to him except another leopard. Bush baby, he is a beautiful leopard indeed. Still quite young, he's still got a lot to grow. He's possibly still gonna grow to double his own body size because he, he's got some good genes and it looks like he, unless he gets his face get drawn by other males later on, he's got a beautiful face. He looks so comfortable right there, it's not even funny. Just need to be careful, he looks like he's going into a deep sleep, he might wake up in on the ground. straight from us to him so we can't um, there's not much we can do about that but it's still just so exciting to see that oh my word this is just this is I need some more expletives and adjectives maybe just the you know, GCM if not, we have no idea what that means but apparently I keep saying it's this, uh, I'm just, I'm gonna just try and amble forward a little bit and get downwind of him. Let's see if that works. He's, yeah, he's straight out there. It is very, very, 
very difficult for genre. Thomas said, no way, three different art folk. Well, of course, I mean, we could just come clean and say we've just been driving around the same one in a circle, but I promise you we haven't. <laughs> this is definitely a third one. And unfortunately, this, this one got the drop on us because he's upwind of us, so the, our, our scent is blowing um, straight from us to him. Um, Ellen, Ellen calls them pig bunnies. <laughs> yes, um, this is... Hey, this, you, we could have a worse afternoon than this. I, I, think, um, I think we're just going to sit on a dune and have a sundown and just, just chill, I think. Or we could go for number four. What's the vote? Jandre is saying going four. Four. still with our mother Cheetah and her two youngsters and you might notice that mum has moved a little bit. Look at that little youngster yawning in the front there. So that restless young male very cunningly went and positioned himself in front of that bush that you can see in the middle of the screen and mum followed suit shortly and the reason for them doing that is that this chilly breeze that I've been speaking about is blowing from the other side of that bush. So they have very cleverly positioned themselves with the bush between them and the wind to keep themselves as warm and cozy as possible with the coming of night. And look at mum just sleeping super soundly And a little female in the front grooming herself and that little male at the back just peering over his mom's body. Look how mischievous he looks. Looks like he's planning maybe to pounce on his sister. Wouldn't that be amazing if he did that? Oh my word. That would be so cute. But I don't think it's quite the right mood for the scene that's in front of us. Everyone looks very kind of relaxed and ready for some sleep. Of course, mom's twitching tail. Look at how that little male is looking at mom's tail every time it twitches. The female just trying to bat away more than likely some flies that are buzzing around her rear end. And of course, that black and white stripy wiggly thing makes for an ideal play toy if you're a little cheetah cub. Oh, listen, they're purring. You can hear that. They were purring. That it must have been the little youngster. Just so nice having mom cuddled up to you. It has stopped now, but it kind of, I suppose it sounds like a domestic cat purring, a little bit like this. Often find that when a mother cheetah and her youngsters are all kind of curled up together, keeping warm, huddled up, you often hear the little youngsters purring in contentment. Very sweet. Oh look, here comes a little female standing up. Again, look at that fluff on the back of her neck. And her arched back. Ooh, look at what she's. Oh, she's noticed something. And if we zoom out, up on the horizon. There's a herd of wildebeest just in the center of your screen there. Just off to the right, yeah, just off to the right there. There are some wildebeest busy grazing on the hillside. Now, a wildebeest is much too big, or at least an adult, an adult wildebeest, excuse me, is much too big for this mother cheetah to try and tackle. But you can't blame a little cub, especially a little cub that is hungry, for dreaming big, I suppose. <laughs> also, just goes to show how sharp their senses are.
Caitlin, you're asking why a cheetah can't withdraw their claws all the way into, she their, into sheaths like leopards and lions and other members of the cat family can. And Caitlin, it's because they don't hunt in the same way and they don't use their claws in the same way as other cats do. So lions and leopards and even domestic cats, they're able to sheath their claws. They need to keep their claws super sharp because they use them for climbing up and down trees and for getting a good solid grip on their prey so that they can wrestle it to the ground. A cheetah, while it can climb trees, it doesn't climb trees in the same way as a leopard or a cat would do. It doesn't go straight up and down. It'll only really be able to climb a tree if it can jump onto a branch or if the tree's slope that it can kind of run up. And then it won't use its claws to pin its prey down. because It doesn't wrestle its prey. It would, instead of or ambushing, stalking, or stalking, ambushing, and then tackling its prey and wrestling it to the ground. It will chase it, and it needs those claws to be out to help to, them to keep traction on the ground as they run at those high speeds. And then it will then trip its prey up, and then get onto it and grab it by its throat. So a little bit of wrestling at the end, but not quite the same as how a leopard or a lion or another cat would kill its prey. Oh, that little young female is super alert. Look at now, she's lifted her head up. I don't know what she's seeing off to the left. I don't see anything in that direction. But she's still peering at those wildebeers from behind the cover of the bush. She's doing a very good job of concealing herself at the moment, making sure that she uses all available cover to prevent the wildebeest detecting her. And mom grooming her. This is just fantastic everybody. So nice to, what a day also from, we've had today. We started the morning with, with lion cubs and now it looks like we're going to end our afternoon or the last few minutes of daylight we're going to end with cheetah cubs oh let's see what this little cheetah gets up to look at how she's oh, i was going to say she looks like she's stalking but i think she's just stretching <laughs> she's going to sit to look at those wildebeest And look at how while she's sitting like that, she's she's got her ears pricked forward, but they at the same time they kind of drooped to the side of her head. And that's a typic, very typical cheetah behavior when they're stalking something. They want to try and minimize their body profile to make themselves as inconspicuous as possible to their potential prey. And look at this, she's off on a mission. Where are you going, little one? You gonna try and hunt those wildebeest all by yourself? Jenna, you're saying this is so cool. I absolutely agree with you, Jenna. And I'm very interested to see where this little cheetah goes and what she does. Well, those wildebeest are a long way away. It'll be a long way for her to stray from her mum at this young age. No, oh, she's sitting down. Looks like she's lost her courage or decided that maybe this is not the best idea. Looking back at mum, maybe it'll be nicer cuddled up with you and brother behind that bush. But sitting straight upright, and still looking over in the direction of where those wildebeest are. And mum has now sat up too, and she's looking over at her daughter just keeping an eye on her, making sure that she knows exactly where she's going. Mum hmm, is looking pretty wide awake now as well. I wonder if maybe they don't decide to move their resting spot a little bit. We're going to spend a few more minutes with these cheats, everyone, and see what they get up to. This is a very, 
very, very cool sighting we got here. It's a Gabar Gossok. Gabar Gossok. Uh, there he goes, there he goes, there he goes. Incredibly adept flyers, and they hunt other birds, actually chasing them on the wing. They'll catch them on the wing. Um, so he's just gone to a, a range that's a little bit difficult for us. But it's just really nice to say is to see broad wings, wide tail. It's actually a narrow straight tail, but they actually got a nice, um, they fan it out when they're chasing other things. So they super, super, um, what's the word? No, 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 come help me out here, Jean-Dre. Agile. Agile, agile. That's it, they're agile hunters, very, very agile hunters. Jean-Dre is useful to keep around. Eh? He's like a good, good dictionary there. Um, but I'm just having a whale of a time out here this afternoon. Eh? Jeez. Try, no problems. So we're going to try for number four on the art fog just because it's fun. And let's see what we can do here. So what we do is, as we're driving, we're using these dune crests, these high vantage points. We stop on there and then we scan with binoculars. And um, that's one of the best ways to find art fog out in this environment. Yeah, so just on the top here, we're going to stop and scan. joined us just at the right time everybody and it seems that the curious little female has enticed her brother to get up and come and join her in her little adventures and even mom is up as well she's looking quite fidgety that whole relaxed demeanor that she had earlier is all but gone and it looks like she might move around a little bit see the cubs there through the bushes just waiting as if to say come on mom it's time to go Where are we going to go next? What are we going to do? Are you going to catch us some food? Quite nice to see there the two siblings together. Look at how much smaller that little female on the left is compared to her brother. She's got a much smaller head. Ooh, it looks like the little one's stalking mum. That was too precious. <laughs> it was like a half stalk. Ooh. It looked like the, the female, or that looked like the mother cheetah over there was maybe feeding on some of the grass there. And big cats will often do it just like dogs will, if there's an imbalance in their, in their diet. I've often seen big cats, especially lions, eating grass when their tummies are pretty empty. together sniffing mum oh and there remember I said earlier that black and white tail how it's irresistible to a little cub look at how that little female cub is batting mum's tail around like it's a pool noodle or something oh and the young male has seen it too and of course anything that his sister has he'll want to take away from her aren't they just so beautiful It looks like mom is settling down a little bit more now. And they're all lying down again. I must say I was gonna be, I was gonna be a little bit surprised if this female cheetah did move at this time of the evening. And that whole scenario with the wildebeest, I thought we were gonna have a replay of something I was very lucky to watch about a year and a half ago we were sitting at an open an open clearing with a mother cheetah and her single cub the cub was a little bit older than these two and while we were sitting there watching them all curled up and resting an enormous wildebeest bull came into the clearing on the opposite side um, to which they were and the guests that were on the vehicle all got very excited and they 
thought, oh my goodness, are we going to see a cheetah kill, or are we going to see this cheetah kill this wildebeest? And of course I said, no, well, as I said earlier, a big wildebeest is much too big for a, a female cheetah like this to, to tackle. And the words were not even out of my mouth when the little cub started to stalk the wildebeest. And before we could even react, the cub started to try and chase the wildebeest. The wildebeest got a massive fright and started to run away with the cub in hot pursuit. And the mother, meantime, was watching this, and I just could just imagine, and if she were a human, she would have been rolling her eyes at what was going on. But then she too stood up, and she also started to chase this wildebeest. And it was a massive chase across the, across the, across the clearing. And eventually the cub gave up, and the mum kind of caught up easily to the wildebeest, and then eventually kind of tapped off on the accelerator and cantered to a halt and the wildebeest carried on running and then they came back and lay down all together. All right everyone we're going to leave this mother cheetah and her youngster or youngsters rather um, just to give them some time to settle into their environment in the dark we don't want we want to give them as much time as possible to kind of take in their surroundings and make sure that they are safe. Like I, said, I really want to go and find them again. So we're going to leave them and we'll go see what Barney's got for you in the meantime. <coughs> Welcome back to and beyond Ngala. If you were with us this morning, we have managed to come back to the pride, which looks like they're already starting to get up can see the young cubs looks like they're doing their rounds on going and greeting and trying to wake up all the older siblings they have moved slightly from where they were or left this morning <coughs> of course it's already started cooling down you can see majority of their heads are up and they're already starting to yawn more and more it looks like in a very short space of time they might get up and start moving again their general direction they've been kind of heading sort of more north, the wind is blowing from the, no from the north to the south, so it's a southly wind, which is an excellent thing for them with the direction that they're choosing to head towards. That does mean that if there is any sort of prey close by, they've got a little bit of a head start that they'll be able to smell their prey before the prey smells them. And of course, they were successful just the night before yesterday, so maybe that could be repeated and looking at how their babies were looking this morning to now some of them start slightly look slightly emptier than this morning of course they would have slept for most of the morning but digest and get up and go to the bathroom as we sit here i think we're sitting <laughs> directly downwind to where some of them might have gone to the bathroom earlier on the smell is not the greatest i'm glad you can't smell that so they slowly but surely getting ready there's a way more activity that they would have been in the middle of the day even if we were to be here let's see how long it takes them before we get up and be on the on the road again and to see what they're gonna get okay that adult lioness yawning Cindy, it's a beautiful pride indeed. The lioness is out of this pride, Cindy. They're so big. They've got such good genes that they are possibly some of the biggest lionesses I've ever seen. So back to the story of yearning, looking at how some of the females are grooming themselves and they were busy yearning earlier on. One thing with lions, every single thing with animals might be interpreted differently to what we call, what things means to us. So with lines, completely the opposite to what yawning means for us. We yawn because we're tired, we're about to go to sleep. Cats yawn because they are just starting to wake up, just giving their brains a little bit more oxygen so that they can start moving. And most of <coughs> these lions, including that lioness, big lioness slightly to the right, has been yawning few times consecutively, which does make me think that she's ready to move. If she gives us one or try two, two more yawns, chances are that she's going to get up and start moving. 
And if that happens, majority of them will most likely start following. At the moment, she's just busy grooming herself, just getting rid of all possibly the blood or the stomach content or anything that she would have got that doesn't make her look neat from what they had on that buffalo. And right next to her, it's one of the young cubs that is also yawning. So it looks like we're going to go somewhere shortly. So of course this light is starting to fade down slightly to possibly be dark in the next 10-15 minutes or so. We're gonna stick with these lines for a little while and see what they do while we take another yarn from the adult lioness. And let's see what how long they take them before they get up. Our hippopotamus is back in the water, but this time with something else on its head. I don't know if this is a little grebe. It's a young bird sitting on top of the hippo's head. Not the oxpeckers this time. I'm sure this is the same hippo we saw earlier. If any of you can ID this bird, please okay. do let me know. starting to set so you can see the reflection and the glow all across Gauri Dam and the reason I'm back here is because I'm convinced Lamba's around here somewhere. This is a perfect time that leopards will get mobile and I'm convinced she's here. I've been round and round and I can't see any tracks of her leaving this area. Many of you are convinced it's a little grieve. I also think so. Bigger, of course, but still young. And deciding that sitting on a hippo is a good idea. Are you friends? And this does just show you that hippos are not friends. If hippos were carnivores or bird eaters, this little grebe would be snapped right up. But of course they're not. They're herbivores. This is actually very sweet to see a ginormous grey mammal make friends with a feathery creature. A young one at that. And I'm glad he's back in the water. <laughs> a mini tsunami for that little grebe. Wow! It's a little grebe. Did you hear that? one of my favorite bird calls. Karishma, you're asking a very difficult question. I hope I get this right. Do I think... <laughs> Sorry, this hippo's just been very entertaining. I think it's Dewey. I'm not sure if it... I really believe they're playing with one another. Inter, interspecies play. Kushma, you're asking, do I think animals are aware of their strength? <laughs> That's a very tricky question. I'm not entirely sure I know how to answer it, but you did refer to the hippo being stronger 
the water than in the water. I think an animal... <laughs> this is ridiculously entertaining. I think an animal like a hippo would be aware of its own strength with regards to what it can challenge and what it cannot. Of course, there could be misjudgment, but I think, let's just take a leopard, for example. Leopard very much knows that it could easily take on a hyena, but a leopard would rarely take on four hyenas and a leopard would not approach a lion. So with regards to that, Karishma, I do think most species, I'm not sure I can speak for them all, have some sort of self-awareness of their strength. I also think that species are aware of what's a threat and what's not. And this is a perfect example. You have a massive hippo with huge teeth and tusks and a tiny little grebe. And yet this grebe has shown absolutely no fear. It's aware that the hippo's not a threat, but yet that hippo potentially could really injure that animal or kill it. But the grebe is quite confident that it's not going to. So there has to be some sort of cognitive awareness, some sort of self-awareness of their own strength. I think that's learned behavior. I think when most mammals at least are young, there's a lot of experimenting. Leopards, for example, will try hard when they're young to kill things or maybe get it wrong. They got to learn what angle to tackle things from. How... <laughs> Roly poly. Put it in pie. What an adorable sunset segment. What a fantastic moment. I'm really happy I got to share that with you all. I'm going to let my... Oh, oh. That's defecation time. Yep, helicopter style. We are going to let our hippo do his thing and send you over to some very playful lion cubs. We're back with the bride. They have been slightly active, getting up, moving and lying down again. You can see the lioness closest to us is giving this young female cub a detailed clean. You would have noticed on your screen that the pictures are now black and white. As she stands up, stretch and look like she's about to go. We have switched over because we're losing our light very slowly. We've switched over into infrared which is the picture we're using without having to put a light on these lines however it sacrifices the color but you can still see it perfectly without any light shining on these lines whatsoever and that is just to make sure that we are being extra sensitive to them and also because they've got those tiny little cubs with us putting the light we might attract attention of the other predators if they're close by like hyenas which a hyena might try and sometimes might get it right, but with the whole pride settling down together like that, that hyena will be suicidal. But that so it could be dangerous for things like other <coughs> other predators, like other lions, if they're not part of the same pride. And also the fact that there is those cubs that are only about three months old, we try and avoid just to be sensitive on their eyes, not to put the bright light at all. So if you can just bear with us, I think. Yeah, not putting the light is the great, great thing, and having this infrared light that helps us to see these animals without disturbing their movement is actually quite a great thing. So look at how these two lioness and the young female are giving each other a detailed, detailed lead. It does look like they might be the first two to eventually get up and starting to move. They've been more active than the rest. They've stood up a few times. 
And the, the lioness is giving the mother a detailed clean at the back of the ears. It looks like she might be picking up some ticks every now and again, seeing how she stops in one spot and starts using her teeth instead of her tongue. And the rest of the bride in the background are also slowly but surely doing the same. One of the big lionesses has just popped her head up looking far behind on the distance she woke up quite suddenly there like she said something which i didn't hear but look at how focused she is and she stands up again she looks back onto that direction as i just indicated their sense of hearing is much more better than ours not only because i'm talking but it's definitely something that's happening that they hear that I didn't hear. Look at how all three other lionesses are so focused back on that direction. Something we talked about this morning, look at that. If you look carefully, something we talked about this morning, which you can see clearly right now, is that black behind the ears as all of them turn their heads and look on the direction which I'm 100% sure they heard something there which I can't see yet. And it looked like they're gonna try and carry on to see what it is. Look at the whole bride now, it's up and facing back that way. So it will be interesting to see what that is. We will hang around with them for a little while and see what unfolds. Way home everyone, and we have found ourselves hemmed in by an enormous herd of buffalo. They've surrounded us on all sides, just as we were driving past. Listen to that, listen. Can you hear those monkeys going berserk, everybody? There's a very loud chattering sound coming from just in front of us. It sounds like... I've never heard monkeys... I've never heard monkeys going that crazy before, everybody. It sounds like something has potentially tried to attack them while they've been roosting. Oh, my goodness. But I was going to get you all to listen to those, just the sounds of the buffalo around us as they're walking their hooves hitting the ground and then moving through the grass. I'm just going to keep quiet for a bit so we can listen. So, with the herd now having crossed the road, we're going to go and see what those monkeys were alarm calling at. And while we do that, let's go and take in the last few rays of light with Dylan. So we are still on the, on the, on the lookout for our elusive number four. But what we're just enjoying while we're doing it, I mean, this massive, massive, massive landscape. The light here this afternoon is just something unworldly. It is absolutely gorgeous. And um, we're just stopping on these dune crests here, these high points, and then just scanning with binoculars. You're looking for any sign of birds flitting around that might give an indication of, and remember, it's not just oh, artfark, it could be pangolin as well that they'll follow. But of course now it'll start becoming more and more challenging because as we head towards sunset, which is another 10 minutes away, um, so these birds are going to be actually going down into their burrows and or nesting sites, depending what species it is. So you'll get less, less clues as to the whereabouts of these other little guys. But what an afternoon, what an amazing 
amazing afternoon we've had out here. Wow. This light is absolutely golden, eh? Yeah, I mean, you don't get better than this, eh? Yeah. And of course, as you can see from that, from that view that you're watching there, the amount of grass out here, you know, to find any other smaller little creatures can be quite a, quite a challenge. But that's what's fun. We have some chems buck down the bottom over here, but I think just, ah, oh, there's a piggy running out in the frame. You'll see him popping out, the little dust kicking up in his, in his tracks over there. It's a warthog. When I say a piggy, I am referring to a warthog. Wow, I'm just loving this light. MJ, you're quite right. How beautiful is this? Eh? This is absolutely spectacular. It's actually nicer when I'm not saying anything, so let me just keep quiet. Ellen says that is living the life. No, it really is. And a whole lot more. And a whole lot more. Now we are quite a long way further east than Tsalu, and so, well, it just gets darker earlier here than it does there, which is totally normal, expected. I'm afraid our wild dogs disappeared, and we had them for another, I don't know, 10 minutes or so after our signal failed us, and enough time for me to, I think, establish quite firmly that they, the female was pregnant. I don't know if you heard me say that. Now, that would be late in the year. It's interesting, but, you know, it's not too late for them to find a termite mound and have pups. So it's definitely worth driving Chitwa, I think, probably more often than we have been, on the off chance that she isn't going to give birth sort of in one of the massive termite mounds on the western sides, eastern sides of Chitwa. Anyway, we'll keep an eye. It'd be quite exciting, wouldn't it? And we had our own very own wild dog den. Hmm. <laughs> yes. Watch and wait, an appropriate name. Saying please let there be a den on Juma. Well we all feel the same. We all at this time of year feel very jealous of anybody who has a den. When I was at Angala, we had a den twice, two years in a row. We had a lovely wild dog den, which is very special. At Londolozi, when I was there, we had one one year. There's one there now, as many of you will know. And the Investic, well, the Pungwe pack now, 
have got a den really not far from Juma's northern boundary and I'm surprised we don't find them hunting here more often. I suppose they're just going into the Manyaleti to hunt. It's a pity Ngala doesn't have one. I mean, it's such a lovely big piece of land. We'll now just quickly check the most underperforming waterhole at Juma. And there is nothing. Yeah, no, that's pretty standard. That's quite a nice reflection we'll have a look at. A listen to the night sounds at Juma's most unproductive waterhole. But it is very pretty. I always think the combination of yellow and navy blue works rather well. Don't you? Hello, Hans. You think that there are lovely noises here? I think there's some pretty nice noises. We can hear a couple of crickets. of cricket sounds. Keela, this waterhole doesn't even have a grebe in it. This waterhole has got some terrapins befouling the water. Uh, a very loyal pair of blacksmith lapwings. That's it. I did have one of my best sightings on foot ever here. The Nkuhuma Pride followed by wild dogs, which was very nice. go back up to the Kalahari where it's a bit redder and a bit brighter. We've stopped on another dune crest now and we are just taking in the incredible vastness and beauty of this landscape. And in 15 years being at Swalu, because I, I can't really say working at Swali, kind of, it's, it's a bit unfair. <laughs> but for the 15 years that I've been on Swali, and um, having been through the Kalari many times before that, this place just never ceases to amaze me. The sheer, sheer beauty of it. And you think how ancient this land is. Those hills that you're seeing, those mountains that you're seeing, those deposits were laid down 1.6 billion years ago. And we are at the singular pinpoint in time. We are a dot, tiny, tiny, minuscule dot on this incredible landscape. Ha <laughs> ha. 
fish eagle. No, I didn't collect any of the bulldog from that tree. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> but wow. And just think what secrets those hills hide. What we've still got to discover. And the stuff that we'll never discover about them. Whether it's some historical aspect to it or a species that could always just be out there. Just waiting. Rachel has just asked if people ever climb these mountains for research or recreational purposes. We've got, um, we actually at the moment, we don't have any research projects that are focused on the mountains at all. Um, and because these hills are quite, they're very broken, loose, rocky, rocky hills, um, there's not that much recreational walking. I've, I've done, I, kill, I did a very, it's an absolute thumb suck ballpark figure. In 15 years, I've probably done about 7,000 kilometers um, on foot along these hills. So, yeah, I've seen a lot of them, but there's still massive areas that I haven't covered yet. But I will one day when I'm big. It's endless. So. And it's a, it's the that's the beauty of these systems. These massive, vast spaces. The it's you know it's not just the individual species that we doing our best to try and conserve in these places, but it's. The, the sum of the whole, you know, it's the sum of all these parts that make it, that make it work. It doesn't matter what reserve you're in, you know, it's every single thing out here has a play, so. Yeah, I think we're just going to take a nice relaxed amble back and just take in this beauty. Eh? There's no other words for it. Talking of beauty, we have the most magnificent sunset right across. You can see the Drakensberg Mountains. I think we should just appreciate this for just a moment.
Rainimu? Asking if that's rain on the horizon. I don't think so. So? I hope not. It's really not common to get sort of lots of rain in the heart of winter here. Rain comes with the summer, and it's to do with the pressure cells sort of meeting in the middle and creating a convection cell, and that's what means we get heavy, heavy thunderstorms during summer. Thunder, lightning, heavy rains. But during winter, it's cold temperatures with very, very little rain. And I don't think there's rain on the horizon. But you never know. Even when we have the quiet days out here and we don't find the animals we're looking for, the sunset's always worth it. I'm not going to give up on my hyena mission, everyone. I will continue to search, I promise. Okay, I'm going to take a nice little home too. But for the last few minutes of trying I've just been so excited today about um, not just what we've been seeing on Swalu, but what our colleagues have been seeing these in other places on that as well. And I think, you know, you have, you have good viewing every day. You know, the odd thing here and there, and it's, it's, it's all really fun and exciting. But you get today's, or you get days like today that are just really exceptional on a lot of different levels. And, um, you know, that again, that just highlights the incredible biodiversity in these places. But I think for me, more than that, it goes about, it highlights the biodiversity that's out there in any place. And again, you know, I've said it before, you know, it could be a park close to your house. It could be a small patch of forest in a, within an hour's drive of you. It could be your back garden, literally. Sometimes all it takes is just getting out on the ground, getting down on your hands and knees and start looking for the small little things. And um, so we are incredibly privileged to work in these kind of environments and that's an art, you know, none of us take it for granted ever. Um, but just being able to share these kind of landscapes and the biodiversity that, 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 protect, that, that it protects is just something that's priceless. I mean, we can't put a value on that. So it's very, very special having you all along on the journey. Here. And it is a journey. I mean, it's not a, it's a, it's an end point destination. Krishna has just asked an excellent question. Probably my favorite question of the day in terms of the ecology of the greater area. There's been other amazing questions, but this one, Krishna has just asked, do, Krishna, sorry, has just asked, do the mountains act as a reservoir of some sort? Um, and on so many different levels, that answer is a resounding yes. Absolutely. Number one, as a catchment, for water, so any mountains, doesn't matter how arid your area is, are very, very important as catchments, uh, key drainage areas for water and should be looked after very, very carefully in that regard. But then also as reservoirs of biodiversity, because you've got this gradient from these open flatlands going up into the hills, so your biodiversity in your, in your mountain areas here, certainly in our area, are, is actually a lot higher than anywhere else. So yeah, very, very good, very good point that. And they often act as corridors for other species moving in and out of these areas, vagrants and that, so yeah. But yeah, I, it's just to look at these landscapes and think how ancient they are and what they've seen, if they could talk, I think it would be a story that none of us would even be able to dream of in our wildest imaginations. And we are here, part of it, 
and actually able to share it with you and try get the essence of this landscape across to you. I think have an amazing evening. Wonderful having you with us. Stay safe and we will see you again tomorrow morning.